，哎，看明天吧，咱也不知道。All right, is that being shared? Yes. So I'm sharing the uh, PowerPoint. Can y'all see it? Zoom. No. Okay. Try again. How about now? Yep. Okay. Good deal. Okay. Here we go. So it is Friday. Yay. So we're moving on, and we're moving into malaria today. Um, six seventy, is that right? Alice is there. I don't have mine today. I kept getting frustrated because I couldn't find any. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I also want to recommend, if you hadn't already done, if you hadn't found these, I think y'all have, but these are the tables that are in each unit. And I think I've got them designed where it pops up for just, this is all the tables for the whole parasitology. But if you find, it, it gives you like quick reference to what we're actually going to be going over today, which is Vivax, Ovalid, Malaria, and Falciparum. So those are our plasmodiums. So that's where we are, plasmodium and malaria. So we kind of have, a, it's a really good history uh, introduction. We won't spend quite a lot, a lot of time. You can actually um, go back and find this. But if you look, you see that Southeastern United States for Vivax, so this is not something that you have to owe It'll never come by. You've already had hematology, right? And hopefully you've already discussed the red blood cell inclusions of plasmodium. Have you? Is that, that's a fair question, right? So you should be familiar with that. So you can ID these when we show a smear of red blood cells that have been invaded by malarial parasites. Did y'all do any of that? I remember talking Remember talking, but maybe never saw a slide? Good, so that gives me the, the chance that when we get to lab, we find this in the lab class, we will have slides for you to go through to identify the different plasmodium, the different. So you see falciparum is in the tropics and subtropics, malaria, subtropics, subtemperate, ovale, West Africa, South America, Vivax, the predominant malarial parasite in most parts of the world, endemic even in temperate zones, including our southeastern United States. So it is definitely a possibility. Um, the Nolisi is a um, Southeast Asia. Has anybody been to Southeast Asia or familiar with the uh, um, macaques, the monkey? Have y'all seen that one? The monkey from Southeast Asia, the cat. It's always in that really, um, um, the like most famous picture of them is when they're in like the hot water and they're like going, you know, like in a hot tub. You never seen those pictures of the macaque? Okay. Well, that the macaque monkey is the native host of the parasite, known to infect humans. 2,500 cases of malaria reported in Malaysia in 2014. 
So a little history lesson for Arkansas was, is that it was here. So uh, early 1700s, malarial cases becoming increasing common in the southern United States. By the late 1800s, the northeastern portion of Arkansas, which we reside in today, was overcome by a massive malarial fever outbreak it would last for years. Okay, so the good from that outbreak in the 1800s was that the late 1800s, the all tan Benedictine sisters were in Missouri at the time and they migrated to Pocahontas and Jonesboro. So that is what's the beginning of what is known as St. Bernard's Hospital that you know today. Or we'll be doing clinicals at St. Bernard's Hospital or even working at St. Bernard's Hospital, either currently or going to in the future. So that was what led to the creation of a six bed hospital known as St. Bernard's. And that was opened on July 5th, 1900. So they have a picture of that in your PowerPoints. Not sure if that, I think, does anybody know their Jonesboro history very well? Is this still here? The original St. Bernard's Hospital? Because I know, you know, Chancellor Dampus always talks about the, you know, the Case House over over on Sorority Row, you know, the one in the middle that they don't do anything with. That's the original chancellor's home. And St. Bernard, is this hospital still here? Does anybody know? I don't think so. Don't think so? Yeah. Y'all didn't take Jonesboro history in high school when you were going through? Yeah. Anybody in Zoom now? Okay. Well, probably give it a try. To help sustain the hospital, the sisters would hop on a train every payday, visit a logging camp, and sell hospital tickets. In exchange for your $9 ticket, they were promised hospital care for the entire year. Isn't that amazing? That they would offer up you year-long health care for $9. I think everybody would take that today. Um, the fundraising effort to supply, you know, to finance the hospital was successful, and they were able to build additional and current facility the following year. So another history lesson with malarial, think about the military sending off um, military off to all parts of the world. And we have our introduction of DDT, uh, which is an insecticide. And what, what vector do you think we're trying to eliminate here with malaria? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, yeah. So if anybody's real familiar with the malarial efforts today, Maybe the Gates Foundation, if you're familiar with them. Familiar with Gates Foundation? Bill Gates? Linda Gates? No? They give a lot of they give away a lot of money. Y'all are probably more familiar that Bill Gates was gonna put a chip in you with the vaccine, right? That, that was on the internet too, right? Y'all hadn't heard any of that? Okay. Well anyway, today's effort for malaria is mosquito nets. Okay. So if you're sleeping in areas where malaria, malaria is endemic, a mosquito net at night is a way of preventing getting bit by the mosquito. And that's the vector um, that transmits it. So DDT was sprayed. I think there was, there's still issues with DDT and maybe being cancer causing. Um, vector control in Haiti, we got some historical pictures here. So basically eliminating the the habitat for the mosquito. So now you're thinking, well, we have mosquitoes, right? We're like the mosquito capital of, of Arkansas, right? Or the, the United States this year, because we have what? We have irrigated farm fields every year that give water supply out for mosquitoes to breed and increase their numbers. And if it's like my neighborhood on a summer night, when the sun goes down, mosquitoes are out. There's not much we can do. So if we control the arthropod vector, uh, this was one, this is great, I like this, because I would like us to put this into to action today. Uh, using precision guided sterile insect technique. This is, this is taking the mosquito and making it sterile. So it's great because you, Use a genetic manipulation, CRISPR, to disrupt the key genes that control female viability and male fertility. So we get end up with a sterile male 
uh, progeny. The sterile insect technique is an environmentally safe and proven technique with 100% efficacy. So why aren't we using this today? I don't know. Good question. Anybody in, uh, walked out into rice fields when high school still may do it in the summers? No? Any farmers in the room? Anybody grew up being a farm kid? There we go. All right. Good. So if we could control the vector, if we could sterilize the mosquito so it doesn't able to breed, the researchers envision a, sy a system where we genetically alter and produce eggs of targeted pest species. The eggs are then shipped to a pest location virtually anywhere in the world. So we hatch those eggs, deploy the pest location. The newly born sterile males will mate with the females in the wild and that makes them incapable of producing offspring, driving down the population. So we're playing with mother nature here to try to eliminate the mosquitoes. You know what would probably push for that would be what? If all of a sudden we had a malarial outbreak in Jonesboro next week, right? Not during the winter time, but if we had that, that would probably push for it. Um, how many of you know all the, the diseases mosquitoes carry? Anybody? They don't carry anything but malaria, right? Carry others too, right? If you've ever been stricken by one, you know me and viruses. Um, you know, there was one um, mosquito vector just in Little Rock, started having blurred vision, headaches, sore neck, went to the doctor finally. Um, viral infection, probably from a mosquito bite, gave me some kind of encephalitis, right? So they're, they're there, so why don't we do a little, a better job at controlling the mosquito? Uh, great question. Uh, the Anopheles mosquito, here we have um, something from blood bank. I don't know if you've gotten there yet, have you ever got to red blood cell antigens yet? Well, you will. And there's one called Duffy. Does anybody know the abbreviation for Duffy? You will. Yeah, it's, it's big F, little Y, Duffy A and B. Okay, Duffy is a red blood cell antigen that actually provides resistance to the invasion of the red blood cell by the plasmodium vivax. Okay, so that's one of those things you're gonna come across in blood bank. So there are certain genetic changes in certain populations of Americans that provide that historically from history, from the ancestry of being if they're from a area that has high malarial rates, then they have the Duffy antigen. Okay. So definitely something to pay attention to once you get into blood bank antigens. All right, you are at least to A, B, antigens, right? And D, I've gotten there. Okay. Yeah, I haven't introduced any others yet. Kale. Oh, okay. So you're just, they're still on the RH antigens. Okay. Just checking. All right. So here's a scary picture of our scanning electron micrograph of the pesky mosquito. We have many pictures. In case you've never seen one. Anybody haven't, has anybody here never seen a mosquito? When you were a kid, did you let them just fill up to see how fat they could get before you smashed them? Yeah, I think we, we all did. It, yeah, right? You never let it like just sit and fill up, see how fat it could get on your... No, it is. Okay. Okay, I'm just asking. That's what I did. That was my entertainment as a kid. That's probably why I got viruses. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, we have to keep our shirts on. This is from 1943, more of the South Pacific area. I promise I won't spend our whole time on history. We'll, we'll get to some good, you know, the real stuff here in a little bit, but I think it, it's good to see, uh, hopefully learning from, from these. Uh, you know, cartoon humor here, you are here. Go ahead and bite. Uh, estimated 216 million cases were reported in 2016. 
nearly 440,000 of those people died of the disease that same year. So where are we with COVID? I want to take a shot. All right, we're at four, 400, right? U.S. pushing for five, half a million, right? Um, and just to put that in perspective for uh, COVID-02, right? Remember we had COVID-02 before we had COVID-19. COVID-02 was 1,800 people perished that year from that COVID coronavirus outbreak. So that was, to give you a little history of where we're going with that, is that was the, the historical picture we had from 2002 to where we are today. So um, a, a totally different story, night and day, between the last COVID uh, outbreak and, and this one. Um, so you got some studies with plasmodium parasites among blood donors uh, and found that almost 24% tested positive that they had been or infected uh, varied from zero to 74 in different areas, different places in the, uh, the, in the study. So you take uh, researchers in Kenya and did a 47 participants and what they did was they gave them ivermectin. Uh, anybody on a lab, Labrador retriever, anybody, duck hunt, keep, your, keep a big dog outside, anybody? No? Y'all have dogs? Anybody have a dog? You have it on campus? What's the one thing you gotta do for a dog that stays outside or even inside? Protect it from who? Heartworm, right? Well, kind of the same story here. Ivermectin comes up with heartworm treatment. Same thing here with, the, they gave ivermectin to people. Uh, in three consecutive days, they took blood samples and when the mosquito fed on the ivermectin, they died. Okay, so just taking up the blood meal from the patient with ivermectin in their in their system is poisonous up to for up to a month. Uh, so that's what you want to do with ivermectin because it is. Let's see, let's see, we're still killing mosquitoes, but here's ivermectin: broad range spectrum of antiparasitic, primarily against the parasitic worm. Okay, that's where it's used for heartworm. That's why I brought up the heartworm story. Um, because if the female heartworm ends up in the, the heart of the pet, then it grows, right? And that's where we, we don't get positive heartworm antigen until that happens. So now to the real story of today is the life cycle of plasmodium. So um, we got our words back. We got some of these words that we're gonna have to work through the sporogony, sexual reproduction, takes place within the definitive host, which is the female mosquito. That's key to remember. Sexual reproduction occurs within the GI tract of that female mosquito, <coughs> where a macrogametocyte and a microgametocyte get together, which are ingested within the blood meal mature into macrogametes and microgametes. Those macro and micros come together, form the zygote. The zygote elongates to become the, the uh, euconete. Penite. The euconete penetrates the stomach wall of the mosquito and develops into the oocyst, whichever way we wanna say that. What do y'all think? Y'all decided on that, if we're gonna say oo or we're gonna say oo, what are we gonna do? Let y'all decide. I've, I've called it both things forever. So just because you'll hear ooh, sis, you'll hear oh, sis, you'll hear oh, oh, help you spell it. Right. What do you think? Want to vote? Google. It's already been Googled. I'm just seeing what y'all think. Because I figured y'all went home and you're like, Mr. Rector's saying ooh, ooh. Is that right or oh, oh? Say ooh. Where, where are my English majors again? We're CLS majors. Well, I know what you took English. What about the O with the O double dot across it? What's that? See, I scare Dr. Walls sometimes because I'll go in and I'll start just hammering some names, you know, and she's like, are you really hammering them like that? Or are you? It's just, 
part of my teaching technique, right? So what do we think? Say it how you spell it. Say it how you spell it. So, oh, oh. So you don't leave out one? Oh, oh. Or you want to go, ooh. I think oh, oh is fine. Oh, oh. Okay. Whichever way y'all decide, we will stick, try to stick with that. Let y'all call it. Okay. All right. So this oocyst, within the oocyst, cell division occurs producing the sporozygotes, zygotes, right? Not zygotes, but zygotes. And we're going to see this all on a big picture in just a minute. So we're just kind of working our way through here. Those sporozoites migrate to the salivary gland, right? The infective stage, then when that mosquito does what? Sporozoite, which is injected into the blood of human when the mosquito feeds. So this has always been what? The scary issue is, yes, a mosquito can carry malarial from <coughs> to the next person, right? So why can't the mosquito carry other things? And, you know, one of that comes to mind, the question I always got was HIV. You know, why can't a mosquito infect people with HIV? Fight an HIV positive, go fight one that's not, right? But it's not really the bite, it's the life cycle, right? So the mosquito, this life cycle occurs in the mosquito to get all the way back to what? The infective stage that is then transferred with the bite, okay? So HIV, you know, it's not, it's not gonna be doing its thing in a mosquito. It might be taken up, right, from a white blood cell, right? We know it invades the T4. But then the white blood cell is not kept whole when it comes through the mosquito. So that, there's a whole different thing there. Chizagony, which is the asexual reproduction. So we have both here again, which occurs in the intermediate host, which that would be us, occurs in two station, sta station, stages. We have pre-erythrocytic chizagony, occurs in our liver. And then we have the erythrocytic, meaning the red blood cell, chizagony, which is, occurs with the red blood cell. So we have two, two different spots. The pre-erythrocytic, the sporozoite injected into the blood invades the hepatic cell. So that sporozoite, where did it come from? Female mosquito bite. Asexual reproduction in the liver cell produces the merozoite which is exoerythrocytic. Some vivax or ovale sporozoites enter a resting state becoming dormant forms known as hypnozoites. The merozoite can rupture in the liver cell, then it invades the bloodstream. That becomes the erythrocytic chizagone, right? Merozoite from the liver infects red blood cells. This is where we see it. So you get the E. coli or the applique, right? Applique forms, crescent forms. And that's the key. Did y'all did, did see any pictures of the crescent forms? And he probably had it on a PowerPoint one picture. All right, we've got some slides. We're going to see some slides. Um, so we get this crescent form found in the margin of the newly infected red blood cell. We're going to see plenty of pictures today. Penetration of the red blood cells followed by growth in the red blood cell of the parasite all the way to the trophozoite stage. Okay, so we're familiar with, you know, cysts to trophozoites. We've been harping on that quite a bit. Here we're getting um, the merozoites rupturing, going in, penetrating the red blood cell, actually going into the trope. So here is that ring, the E. coli form, red blood cells here. So we're going to start to see things inside red blood cells. Okay. The trophozoite, the signet, that's what it is, the signet ring or an early stage of development occurring just after penetration. The organism consists of chromatin, small amount of cytoplasm surrounding a vacuole. So it almost gives that, you know, we talked one that we had a long time ago, you know, flower basket, but this is going to be like a ring. 
Uh, the amoeboid forms are highly modal tropes, which may assume bizarre irregular shape forms within. So you get this trope starting to form inside the red blood cell, and it can do all kinds of things, even to a band. You'd say, oh, that's a banded. Oh, that's a red blood cell, not a white blood cell, right? The band forms are trophozoites which stretch across the red blood cell. So here's some drawings. We see this signet ring, okay? We see that shortly after invasion of the red blood cell. See them out here in the peripheral coming into the, and then we see this young trope starting to form. That's that band form. And then you got this huge trope inside the red blood cell. Mature trope forms are late stage of development before asexual multiplication. Schizonts, word we, we hit on earlier, I think I hit on it last time, are red blood cells which asexual reproduction occurs producing new malarial parasites, the merozoites. Okay, so we say we got this development which is basically seeding for when what? When the red cell ruptures, then all of these are released to do what? Go invade other red blood cells. So then you start to get invasion from this development. So here are the schizonts, this is the merozoites. These are going to rupture eventually and form or invade the next red blood cell to do it all over again. So the merozoites, malarial parasites resulting from the schizogony, exoerythrocytic or and erythrocytic, rupture of that red blood cell releases the merozoites Toxic products cause peroxisomes of malaria. Merozoites may infect other red blood cells with multiplication cycle, or they may mature into male and female gametocytes. Macro and micro gametocytes are ingested by the mosquito. So the next mosquito comes in, right? Takes up another blood meal, and then we got gametocytes getting spread to the next patient, the next victim. So macro, female, micro, male, macro, female, micro, male, macro gametocyte, macro gametocyte, all these little things. You want to think of them as like new seeds, can. So here is what we want to spend our time, and I think we, we're right on time. I think we're good. So this is uh, the CDC life cycle, very complicated, or it looks complicated, right? But not really. We have our exoerythrocytic cycle up here. We have our erythrocytic cycle here. So let's take number one. Let's just start there at the top in the middle. Mosquito takes a blood meal injects four zoites as it's taking its blood meal into the new patient, okay? So then what happens? There's an invasion of the liver cell, human liver stages, okay? Schizont forms, rupture of the schizont now, that's ruptured. And what are these schizonts gonna do? They're gonna invade a red blood cell. It's the erythrocytic stage. Red blood cell, we get the signet ring formation. Okay, so diagnostic starts here. Okay, so that's you doing a CBC, doing a smear. We're gonna see pictures where we do smear, thin smears or thick smears or just thick drops, leave it there where we actually spread it out. So that diagnostic stage continues because of that signet ring inside the red blood cell. Remember it can go two ways go to back to a schizon here, right, and rupture and invade more red blood cells. So it's just kind of a little circle here going around and around. Or it can do a mature trophozoite, right, or is that the mature troph, right, here. This is a ring into the gametocytes, either macro or micro, right. It comes down here, we got our male and our female. And then this is what? This is available for the next mosquito to take up the gametocytes. 
those gametocytes inside the mosquito gut. Okay, right here, and we're fixing to get into this this uh, sporagonic stage where it releases more sporozoites and it continues. This is huge, right? So not that complicated, but a lot of different words, a lot of different terms that you're just getting introduced to, and I know it's difficult, but it just takes time just to tell the story. Look at what we're talking about. Stay on you know, the human side here for a little bit, and then understand what happens here when we get the gametocytes forming so that these can continue on into the next mosquito, into the next patient. Infective stage and diagnostic stages are, here's infected, Here's diagnostic, diagnostic, diagnostic. Okay, if you can follow that. Is everybody good with this? Kind of got a good picture. Does it help? I would like look at this and then read back over the notes. That's the easiest thing. Just go back to that step by step and see where we are with the words and the notes and put it together with your uh, life cycle here. All right. So disease, disease of course, simply enough, red blood cells are destroyed. You come up with anemia. You come up with hepatosplenomegalia. Everybody know what hepatosplenomegalia is? Who doesn't know? Is it the enlargement of liver and spleen? Yeah, there you go. If you're destroying red cells, you're gonna increase the spleen size for sure. Early symptoms include headache, muscular aches, photophobia, anorexia, sometimes vomiting. I've had photophobia, it's no fun. I had muscle aches, everybody's had a headache, right? That's just, it just seems like that's mosquitoes. Anytime we end up with that, we end up with some kind of, you know, um, encephalitis, meningitis. Chills are caused by sensation of extreme cold. The skin is pale, cyanotic, fever, uh, sensation of extreme heat follows the patient becomes flush. So what is happening is you're doing what? You're cycling. Okay. With malaria, you go up and down with fever. So fever comes and goes. So one of the questions they'll ask you, are you having night sweats? Are you, are you waking up in the middle of the night with profuse uh, sweating? Um, when he relaxes and sleeps out the sheer exhaustion after sleeping, the patient's temperature returns to normal. They feel better until the next attack. So here is our thick and thin smears for diagnosing. Staining that, yes. All familiar. Has anybody taken the one hand challenge? You've seen that on Facebook, anybody? Y'all were making smears galore last semester, right? Hopefully, y'all didn't make smears last semester. Y'all didn't make your own like smear. Yeah, did like one day. <laughs> one day. Well, there's the there's this challenge right now. This, we we need to keep stay on task or we'll run out of time. But it's only nine thirty, so they're doing a one hand challenge. So, but you took your slide, you take your tube, you put your drop on, you reach for the new slide, and you make your smear all one handed. Instead of holding it, you just place it down. Okay, I'll have to pull that up when we got time. I'll show you. Okay, John only made like one smear. Really? One day. One day. Okay. Who? Who? Are, well, I won't say. But if you're an MLT and you're going out to clinical making one smear, you better get some practice in. I would grab me a, a box of slides and and a couple of tubes of blood and do some smears. Um, think of thin, thick and sm thin smears quickly detect the presence of malarial parasite. So it's, you're not going to miss this, right? If you see it, hopefully you've had enough pictures today, or you're going to see a bunch here in just a minute. We can also do polymerase chain reaction. We can do rapid diagnostic tests, RDTs, uh, which brings us back to immunology, where we see that, um, we have this way of, of I, will, I don't think you'll find a lab in your clinical rotation that has a plasmodium antigen test. I would hope not because they probably would expire and then they could just donate it to me.
but I just don't think we'd have the Binax now malarial rapid detection test, okay? Uses immunochromatography, which we're familiar with. It circulating malarial specific antigens, but they're, they're, these are out there. So you can definitely find these. Um, and when you see what you have, you remember, we do something like this with control line, test one and test two. And what you're going to see is, is that each test line, so it's different antigens being tested here in test one and test two. And what you're going to see is, is that we, we have plasmodium falciparum or mixed with two lines of test antigens. If you only get T1, it's plasmodium falciparum. If you only get T2, it's vivax, malaria, and ovale. And then, of course, if you only get the control line, it's a negative test. So, that being said, each plasmodium has different antigens that can be detected. So, uh, it's a good way of, of distinguishing between the different species of plasmodiums here for malaria. So, um, I think you're familiar with this. If you're not, this is a quick, quick review, and you probably think, well, Gosh, we could have used this last semester, right? So again, you know, we're lysing agent labeled antibody right here, and your sample's gonna flow across there on your nitrocellulose strip. You got a test line with bound antibody and a control line with bound antibody. So when you put the blood with it, if this first free labeled antibody captures the antigen, then there's going to be an antibody next on the line capture and light up the line so we see the positive. Okay. So if that is still foreign to you at this point, uh, you hadn't had immunology yet, so hang on, but everybody else that has had immunology should be good with that. So let's look at the differences, and we have some differences here with these. This is plasmodium vivax parasitized host cell, the parasite refers, uh, prefers reticulocytes. You're familiar with that? Yay. All right, so infected red blood cells appear to be enlarged and impale in color. The shape, the typical round shape of a normal red blood cell doesn't change the shape, but there's this uh, stifling known as Schuffner's dots. Have y'all heard of that? Nope. Schuffner's dots are present with who? Vivax. So we're, remember this, this is going to be, um, if you look here on your handout from your table, we have a couple of with Schuffner's, stifling, uh, and then two without. So the two we have with it are going to be Vivax and Ovale, the two without are Malaria and Falciparum. That's a key way of test questions right? Making sure you know the difference in those. And we're going to see those in a minute, so don't, don't freak out yet. Uh, the appearance of the parasite, the signet ring, troph, single infection, thin blue strip of cytoplasm surrounded by a vacuole. There is a single chromatin dot. That's key to remember here with Vivax. Maturing troph becomes bizarre, irregular, amoeboid form. Malarial pigment is seen as brownish color within the parasite. The size of the trope increases until it fills the cell. The Plasmodium vivax schizont has 12 to 24 merozoites, another key identifier. And the fever cycle is every 48 hours. Okay, so you go two days, you get fever. Two days later, you get fever again. Two days later, you get fever again. So it's a cycle of fever. All right, so we're going to see here is our Vivax ring form. Can't miss that right there in the middle. Here we are again. This looks like, what is it? What do you think those are? Out there in the cytoplasm. Again, here's our troph filling up the red blood cell. Troph filling up the red blood cell. Troph 
throw. Throws. Shizon. Remember, looks like a Morula getting ready to release all these little ones to infect others. Shizons. Okay. So when I ask you, let me just go here. What do you notice about this one versus, this is malaria. And I said it didn't have Schuffner's dots, didn't have stifling. So look at that red blood cell. Now go back to Vivax. What do you see? What are all these? Dots. Yes, thank you. Those are dots. Yeah, that was, that's our Schuffner's dot. Okay, so Vivax has them. Malaria doesn't. Okay, does everybody see that? It's not hard, that's easy. Right. Okay, so here, this is malaria. Uh, parasitized cell. This parasite prefers older, mature cells. What was Vivax? Younger, retics, right? Younger red blood cells. So plasmodium malaria looks for infected red blood cells are smaller in size because they're older and there is no stifling. There is no Schuffner's dots with malaria. The signet ring is identical to Vivax. So the single chromatin dot, that's the, the rock on the ring. Singular infection. Okay, so maturing trope. There's little amoeboid activity. The band form is predominantly seen. The troph appears to stretch across the cell. The schizonts average eight meriozoites in a rosette form. Okay, so what's the big difference between Vivax and malaria when it comes to the number of meriozoites? What was the number for Vivax? 12 to 24. 12 to 24, thank you. And this one is now averaging eight. So on your sheet, we see six to 12, eight is the average. So don't get caught up in that, ah, that's, that's nine. That can't be malaria. It's an average of eight, okay? Where Vivax is an average of 16, okay? So double. Parasite appearance. All the gametocytes, Vivax, Malaria, Valley are all, all nearly identical. It is the best to rely on the asexual stage, which is what? The signet ring stage, right? Fever cycles every 72 hours, so 48. Now we're looking at how many days is 72 hours? Three, yay, good, just checking your math. All right, so this is the band form and the malarial band form, no dots. The troph going across, banding the whole red blood cell. Here's the schizonts. We're counting them now, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten. So it can be up to twelve, right? Average eight. Here, schizonts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think that was eight, four, nine. Shizon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Signet ring over here. So ovale, plasmodium ovale, enlarged and pale, ovid and with ragged cell margins, there are Schuffner's dots with ovale. So there's two with and two without. Signet ring, similar to Vivax. Mature tropes are not as amoeboid as Vivax, and their pigment is scanty. Shizon, eight. Average of eight. Gametocyte, not distinctive, because it looks just like all the other gametocytes. Fever cycle, 48 hours, same as Vivax. So there's some similarities between Ovalley and Vivax. They both have dots. Right, their schizonts are a little bigger for Vivax than Ovalley. Signet ring. Troph. 
He looks like he's out. Well, yeah, he's in the cell, I guess, still. He kind of looks like he's out. He looks like he's out there. Remember, Shizon, average eight with, with dots. Okay. We're good. And brings us to falciparum. It infects any cell, any size, a red blood cell, any cells, any size, but no stifling. No stifling present. Appearance of, this, of the parasite, signet ring. The only stage seen in circulating red blood cells are the ring forms and gametocytes. So there's, there's what? What is there nothing of falciparum? Hmm? If we went from the ring where it says, hey, there's no uh, other form than the ring form of the gametocytes, who are we leaving out? With falciparum. Trope, right? Shizonts, the most. Average of 24. So it could be up to 48, or yeah, no, could be up to 36. Sorry, 36, I was looking at my time. Shizonts can be up to 36 merozoites, they average 24, rarely seen in the peripheral blood, right? Because it just said we have ring forms and gametocytes. Large or sausage, banana or crescent shape, fever cycle again, 48 hours. There they are, a lot of rings. More rings. More rings. Gametocyte. Comparison. Platelet artifact over here. Platelet artifact versus plasmodium viociferum gametocyte. I've seen a platelet artifact like that in a while. Okay, just on our way to finish here. Disease complications, cerebral malarial with falciparum. It invades the central nervous system and small blood vessels becoming plugged with parasitized red blood cells. We know something as black water fever is due to the heavy amount of intravascular hemolysis large amounts of hemoglobin pass into the urine leading to a black color of the urine. Transmission. Oh, whoa. All right, we just finished up. Sorry. I'm cool. All right. So this is our last um, blood and t uh, protozoa. And this is the uh, Babesia microti. Abiosis. Transmission is a bite of a tick, so we're kind of changing here at the very end, changing our path. Appearance only ring forms are seen, similar to the rings of falciparum malaria. But the look for Babesia is as Maltese cross. And you can look up Maltese cross. I'm going to show you a picture here at the end of what it actually looks like. Differentiation from malarial parasite is the absence of the malarial pigment. So it's carried by ticks, so it wouldn't be in an area where we had mosquitoes. Babesiosis can be uh, cause serious mal uh, malaise and fatigue, particularly in the elderly, oxygen carrying red blood cells. Some people experience no symptoms. Since it's tick, we bring in Lyme disease. It's often spread by deer ticks. It's most prevalent in the Northeast and Midwestern United States, and it's most common cause of blood infection transmitted by blood transfusion. So you're in blood bank right now. Um, you should see this as an issue when y'all talk about problems with transfusions with babesiosis. There's our tick, our exoides hard body tick. Here it is in the red blood cells. So these are the babesies. Uh, Babsia microti ring forms. 
So inclusions in the red blood cell. Here is the Maltese cross. So that's its, that's its signet form, uh, ring forms inside the red blood cell. So that will be your question probably showing up on a board will be with babesiosis, do we have a Maltese cross? What's that associated with? Babesiosis, babesia, microti. Another Maltese, and that's it. Okay, so we kind of do that at the end, but we got it in because I knew it wasn't but about a minute. All right, so have a good weekend. Uh, we'll stop the share. We got to clean the tables, and we'll stop the recording. And I'll post this to YouTube if you know somebody that missed. Looks like everybody was here.